Hello, everyone. This is another episode, a kicking ass episode of todebate.eu. And I'm Sebastian. And I have again the same co host forever for the past two and a half surprise, years. Surprise, surprise. Derek, surprise, surprise. How are you? Because today I didn't ask you before the recording how you are. <laughs> I'm terrible. My, the dog ate my homework. I do oh, have right. to complain about a million things and probably I don't stand a chance. And I'm oppressed and uh, everybody knows because I'm surveilled. And uh... do, you have, do you even have a dog? <laughs> no. <laughs> you don't even have a dog. Do you have I, a cat? Something that can eat? No. Uh, well, I have, children, kids. No? I have kids. Yeah, my children <laughs> can eat, and they they would if you don't feed them properly, probably eat your homework too. Do you have any any pets? Any I don't know birds, fish, snakes, spiders? Not even a tama. Not even a tamagotchi. Well, no, I have I have my partner, my girlfriend. I don't know if that's that's that, something that, that, that doesn't count. <laughs> to, the, to to our uh, to our Google diversity champion, not sure this uh, this would be uh, <laughs> oh. very uh, very well received. Be careful; she might listen to this and being compared she to actually a does listen. So maybe we just tell our listeners the motion then and and jump right into it. What about this? I I guess we do that, but that's my fault because I asked if you had a dog. So then instead of talking about the internet, we started talking about pets. <laughs> right? And now I'm thinking, oh my god, what kind of uh, what what kind of issues I'm going to be faced with with my remarks about uh, women I can being always, regarded as pets? Uh, I will just edit this out, and then you're just uh, I just leave the remarks about pets in, and then yeah, all is good. Great. And then it will, and then I will look even more dumb just talking about pets and animals. Coming back to it. <laughs> All right, the motion today. The motion today. The free internet is dead, or is it? And by free, what do we mean by that, Dirk? Yeah, I mean free as in free speech, not free as in free beer. So it's not like free of charge. It's basically like free beer? like freedom. I do like beer. I had beer in the past. I still like do you beer. Still like beer? Yeah, but only the beer without alcohol, unfortunately, because I don't do alcohol. All right, all right. Have you, you ever? <laughs> we just, we just digress. <laughs> we're on a short time span. I'm going to get kicked out in 15 minutes, and we're still rambling. All right. No, I don't like beer, and but I drink cider. And Which, my dog did not eat my homework because I don't no, have any homework mine or dog. I'm actually well prepared. I hope, but I'm not sure if I stand a chance. Let's let's try and that's, see. That's that's the motion you suggested. You better be ready. Yeah, for yeah, that yeah. One. I'm. I, I only suggest motions I'm uh, when I'm ready, not <laughs> not before I'm ready. I'm sure of it. All right, so your the turn. flip of the coin decided. I'm four and I go first. Correct. The free internet is dead. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues for the motion. I am old, I have to admit. I grew up when the internet was still very, very young. I dialed in through a modem and some of my connections were to online bulletin boards and not to a global network of interconnected systems like we have today. So back then, what fascinated me was how limitless the space really was. Uh, in a sense, it was, had less limits than the presumably global internet has today. Literally, by, by using a modem, I was able to turn my neighborhood into a global village. I was connecting to the world all of a sudden, speaking with people that could be sitting anywhere on this planet. No matter the, the country they're in, no matter the, the cultural background, I could exchange comics with online friends in South America and read opinion pieces from literally everywhere in global news communities. All of this was powered by open protocols and it was hosted by enthusiasts who created new nodes to this uprising global network on a daily basis. So you could spend hours surfing through creative online projects, one different from the other, and you could state your opinion freely because, guess what? You were anonymous. Now, how does this landscape look today? In most parts of the world, internet providers are required by law to keep records of dial-ins, your phone number is registered, your IP recorded and kept in log files for months, accessible to not only governments, depending on the country, and it might even be accessible to companies as well, state actors and um, have access anyway. So the anonymity is gone. The free, fascinating, creative internet, one might argue, isn't that still around? Well, 
We channel everything to about five major sites by now that dominate our discourse. Free blogs are almost that or taken over by marketing blogs instead. Um, each blog looking just the same because they emulate each other. So on top of that, in the EU, we even try to implement something called an upload filter now. So we channel everything to filters. So we filter out any kind of creativity as well. No, I would say there was a free internet back then, but it's pretty much dead right now. Now it's Sebastian's turn against the motion. My dear old Derek, it was better in the past, in the 19th century. Oh, I'm so sorry. But this is the usual fear that some people have when they think their freedoms are taken away. But the internet, if anything, has flourished over the past few years. You have multiple billion-dollar startups. You have more and more internet users sharing an increasing number of things. And even encrypted services like the messaging platform Telegram have proliferated. In fact, I'll give you the counter, well, the, the same example in the same vein, but with a, maybe a very startling example. If ISIS has managed to communicate globally thanks to the internet, I don't see who would not be able to. Right? If a terrorist organization can do that, well, pretty much anyone can do this. Technologies like blockchain allow for decentralization. We had a debate about whether blockchain was a digital snake oil or not. So I refer our listeners back to that debate. We had another debate about trust and safety on the internet, regulating hate speech. So it also connects to that debate. Likewise, I'm not going to go to that vein. Our listeners can listen to that debate. But because the internet is global, domestic internal activities of censorship and arresting people are really insufficient to suppress freedom. The internet is global. So un non-democratic states, which try to control the global internet, will always fail in the end. Even China and Russia, which try more or less to define and create their own internet, I don't think this is a very viable long-term strategy. Um, I think it will be very difficult to take away the practical benefit of this global internet from citizens away. It's become, the internet, some people say, it has become as essential as air. And many democracies, by the way, are trying to use this internet freedom as part of their global policy strategy against other nations. So this is an interesting twist to it. I'll end up with one thing, and before we go into a more uh, heated or detailed discussion, it's still possible today to set up your own website, right? You can actually do this and have your own server, and it's even easier than 10 or 15 years ago to set up your own server by people who are non-technical and run your own blog on your own machine if you don't want to have more restrictions. So overall, no, the free internet is not dead. If anything, it's thriving. Now, it's Dirk's turn. Let's hear his rebuttal. Oh my God, I want to live in your head just for a day. It must be a fascinating and fantastic place. The things you dream up are mind boggling. So let's start with the first thing you said. ISIS can actually get a global audience. No, they cannot. You know why not? Because they decided to publish on media like Facebook and YouTube, which both are very prominent in the US and both of them are, for instance, blocked in all of China. Now, you might argue, yeah, if I know what I'm doing, I can still access it through a VPN service. Number one, then you're acting uh, against the law in China. Number two, most people are not technically savvy enough. And the claim you make is they have reached a global audience and they would have been able to reach a global audience just 15 years ago or maybe 20 years ago, but not today. The other thing you said, everybody can put up a website and be uh, be reachable through that. Yes, that is true. The only thing is they won't find listeners. My very first personal blog that I opened, like, I don't know, 25 years ago or something, I had literally within the first six months, several ten thousands of people surfing to that web page. More people surfing to my web page, and it was not a porn site, by the way. It was just a boring diary about my endeavors on, on training myself on IT. All my web pages today combined don't attract that numbers that I had back then with a boring personal blog. Because the truth of the matter is, if you're not big on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, what have you, you're not big on a blog site either. And how are you going to be big by spending money? Which also goes to show that the free internet is dead. Because not everybody can afford to just spend money in order to find that audience that you claim. The third thing, you're not allowed to speak your mind anymore. 
the final nail to that coffin is right now put in by the EU through the discussion through Article 11, 12 and 13. Those of you who haven't followed that strain of political fighting right now, the European Union tries to implement a set of regulations that try to govern copyright infringement and terrorism threats. And the only way to really implement what they are about to legalize by the end of this month is an upload filter. And the only big companies in on this planet that are able to implement that kind of upload filters are actually the big companies. So as soon as you publish any type of content, you better channel it through those upload filters because otherwise channels like uh, Facebook, YouTube and what have you will be out of reach for you, which effectively is a censorship filter. So you're basically not allowed to speak your mind anymore. Combine that with laws that spark up everywhere that basically try to criminalize uh, dissent. Uh, yeah, the free internet. Where is it? It's gone. And now on to Sebastian. Let's hear his argument. All right, let me take it one by one. Uh, I think that's an interesting debate. ISIS... Let's go back to them. You say you have to be technically savvy to you know, use VPNs or be able to access ISIS content. Are you saying, Doug, that our beloved terrorists around the planet are technically savvy to be able to access ISIS propaganda? I personally really don't think so. If they found a way to access that content, anyone can. So I really don't, don't agree that ISIS would have thrived as much 15 or 20 years ago. I think it's exactly the opposite. So we may disagree on that, but I really don't think it's about savviness of how to access that content. And it's not about Facebook being blocked. They found other ways to publish content. Uh, and that's the interesting aspect of it. Likewise, you say, and you agree that you can uh, host your own server and have your own content, but then you say we would have, you would have no audience. Here's the trend that's happening. Fine. Imagine you have your YouTube channel. The latest trend on Instagram, on YouTube, on Facebook, is that it's only the major content publishers which attract 90% of the viewers. And it's getting worse. It's only the big names which attract more and more, uh, an increasing share of the viewers. It's not the other way around. So I would actually counter that argument with the actual fact, which is if you're small today, you're going to be even smaller tomorrow, right? So, but the point is you can exist. You can express your opinion. The third aspect, you talk about the EU and the way we have a number of articles which have been discussed, which are not completely voted or in effect. And I looked into it. I was scared initially. It is true. Article 11, 11 is about getting companies to pay for linking to news articles. Article 13 is about copyright detection, as you mentioned, upon upload. But it's not about deleting upon upload, which was initially discussed. Now it's about really copyright management. Copyright management. Hang on. Copyright? This has been in effect for decades so it's just applying the rule of law to the internet, right? The, having a free internet is not antagonistic with having a, a lawful and legal internet, right? It's not like the, the far west where you can do whatever you want and selling drugs or whatever with Silk Road and the Darknet and all these kind of things. It's still applying the rule of law. So if anything, it's just applying existing regulation and trying to adapt to what it is uh, on the internet. It has its host of issues and <laughs> I can see you shaking your head. But I did look into it because I was scared just like you, but I can see that it's still being discussed. It's not finalized. Same thing with GDPR. Same thing with GDPR. All this mess around GDPR, which most people do not understand when this came into effect in May of last year in the EU. In many cases, it was perceived as companies being regulated on how they can use their own data. But hang on, it's not just this aspect. It's also protecting my rights as a user, my rights as a consumer to my personal data. Right, So it's not just a one-way street. I think it's a more complex situation, and it's not a black and white situation. Overall, really, the free internet is not dead. Right, there's like It's a much more complex situation where you can do almost whatever you want on the internet today, and you don't need to be as technically savvy as before. If anything, the latest regulation just tries to morph and adapt existing regulation to a sphere which is very difficult to... Uh, to regulate because it's across boundaries. But no, the free internet is certainly not dead and on the contrary, very thriving. Final statements. Dirk goes first. I beg to differ on so many fronts, but I have only one minute left. So the one I think I pick will be Article 13 that you just depicted wrongly, I have to say. I'm sorry about that, but I also read up and I'm not only scared, I'm terrified. And the thing, the reason I'm terrified is, yes, it has been illegal to publish copy, copyright protected stuff already. 
you were the criminal if you did it. Platforms like YouTube, Facebook and so on were uh, had to remove the content as soon as they learned about its existence and they did it. But you were the criminal if you posted. Now the change right now changes one important fact. In the second that content appears on the platform, the platform is liable as well. Think about that. That means you post something that's copyright protected and all of a sudden YouTube has to fear a fine for this because they can be brought to court with this. They can be punished for it. So what will they do? They will block it. And there are a ton of things that even lawyers cannot agree over if it's free speech or copyright protected material. So what will they do? They will block it. Here it goes, your free internet. I'm sorry for this, but no, there is no free internet. Sebastian. So I think there is a there is a, a distinction between being liable and deleting upon upload, which is a far more extreme step than blocking content. But I agree, it's open to debate. I'll just include, include on two things. One is, as I mentioned, the internet is global. It's extremely difficult to impose any kind of regulation in it. And this is why we're having all these uh, uh, furious discussions and debates across the planet about regulation and breaking up tech giants. Uh, this was in the news of, of a few days ago. And if anything, I'll conclude on one thing. Like, how do you feel, our dear listener? Do you feel you have not enough information or too much information to do on the internet? Do you feel you can publish what you want to talk about or that you cannot express your points of view? I'm asking our listeners, especially our listeners in North Korea, Syria, and Russia, <laughs> to vote and agree with me. The free internet is perfectly alive. I'm joking on that one. I do hope everyone has access to some form of internet, whether it's a VPN. But thankfully, as you uh, pointed out uh, in the reverse way, uh, I don't think you need to be technically savvy to have access to a free internet. It is there. I have to say, it's not my my topic where I feel the most comfortable about. You probably noted I was maybe inaccurate in my speech or in the way I wanted to express things. So then it was an e I was an easy target for you. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, the th final thing you said was that the listeners should ask themselves if they feel they can say everything online. And I would say you cannot. Imagine, imagine, you, imagine you have the opinion, uh, women are not suitable for technical jobs. Imagine you have that opinion um, and you are an American. Would you, feel, would you feel safe to state so in a public forum? I, I assume you would not feel safe to do that, knowing that you're actually not anonymous I anymore. Actually, I disagree. I think you have the, the, the educated viewpoint. And I think most people on the internet, sorry for them, they're not educated or not highly educated. And they would say yeah, it. But there are people that lost yeah, their jobs over this. They would maybe lose their yeah. jobs. And they are they, they are banned from channels. They lost Possibly, their jobs. But it's not, and some it's of not, them are it's actually... It's not to the proportion of people who actually think that. It's a, a handful of cases versus millions of people who think that. Uh, what, what I tried to say is, you know, there has been a time where you could decide for yourself whether or not you disclose your name. And there has been a time where you could decide yourself um, whether or not you participate in certain networks and you don't have that op uh, opportunity anymore. And by the way, ISIS doesn't even need to be uh, uh, broadcasting into China. They don't care about China. They only care about the US and Europe, right? So this is this is like the number one threat area they try to make their threats to. The Actually, there's the Uyghur in eastern China who are Muslim. So in theory, they could reach out to them who are persecuted by the Chinese authorities. Let's see if an Uyghur even can leave the country after having been reached out to by ISIS. Fair enough. Well, anyway, ISIS is dead, according to uh, Trump, right? <laughs> yes. Freedom is under threat. That's at least what I say. Maybe there's some freedom left, but I don't know. You, you sent me an article where somebody tried to just get their privacy. And this was like, I don't know, that, that was astonishing to what length this person got. And I, at some point I wondered, probably if you're an NSA operative, you laugh your ass off when you read this article because you feel like, yeah, that's one click more than I usually have to do, but then I know you all the same. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Uh, in principle, I agree with you. I, I don't think the, the free internet is completely dead, but I agree there's a lot of attacks on freedom with, with dubious explanations such as counterterrorism. Um, and if anything, well, here's the interesting thing. I think up to now, 
that was a joke. Like, there's no way with the extent of, of the amount of data that exists that any counter-terrorism intelligence unit has the capacity to analyze the data. I mean, it has been repeatedly shown time and again that none of them are capable, capable of finding the, the, the needle in the haystack of the information. But that may change with stuff like machine learning. Right, so what I say today is valid for today, based on what I'm reading. But in five or ten years' time, it may actually completely change. It may ju- it may be justified to for for, for surveillance civilian states to actually gather that data because they can make meaning out of it. Then, and we are all surveillance states. That's the other thing, you know. We people in the European Union, we like to tell ourselves that we are not a surveillance state. That's just not true. Fair enough, we, but it's, we, I, I guess it's a spectrum. That it's a spectrum, right? You're less yeah. maybe less tracked That's than in China. Absolutely, possibly. Yeah, you, you have you you have a spectrum between somewhere on the mountain in Switzerland and in the city of London. <laughs> I, I guess so. <laughs> um, I, anyway, it it was a really fascinating debate. I enjoyed that that little back and forth. That it was, was really funny to see refreshing. Your face, I have to say. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll let our, our our very tech savvy listeners, because they listen to our podcast, to decide for themselves. They can vote on to debate.eu. And they can also tune in to our next episode in just a week's time. Hopefully, the free internet will not be gone by then. And that we'll still, still be able to talk about random things. At least we will still be free of charge. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. It's always right. free. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. What's making you laugh? Uh, because you were cracking up the two times in my argument. <laughs> When you meant that you, you were not. And by the way, it was on a porn website attracting 15,000 users per second. <laughs> yeah, right. Watching an average of three minutes of video mm. per user. Right. <laughs> And 144 pixels resolution. Go ahead. All right, my three minutes and then one minute.